Okay, can you just check the other tab? Hello, 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 hello. Test, test, test. But there's nothing in here too. Test, test, okay. Check, 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 check. 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 That's so strange. Test. Test. What? Check, check.
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Stonecrest Community Church. It's so good to be with you, whether if you're joining us here uh, in the room or you're watching and worshiping online. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Joe Reed, the pastor of discipleship leadership development here at Stonecrest. And I'm with... I'm Anna Schumann, and I'm really excited to be here with you all this Sunday morning. Yeah, it's a today, noodle Sunday, right? Oh, it's a noodle <laughs> Sunday. I know some of you may be prepping your meals for family meal. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And today we continue in our Heaven series, All Things Restored, as we um, kind of dive into the word about how the Lord is restoring a family and storing the relationships uh, with one another. Um, and so as we uh, prepare our hearts today, uh, will you stand with us? And I'm just asking you to close your eyes as we uh, read scripture so that you're kind of cutting one sense off to um, pay attention to the words that are spoken over you and to you. And we're going to pray uh, as we read. And so the first is John 14, 1 through 7. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am, and you know the way to where I am going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And so, Jesus, thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And I pray today uh, that we pay attention to the preparation you invite us to. But, Lord, we give you thanks that you have a place for us in your presence. And, Lord, that you have a place today to step into your presence. And we give you thanks. From Revelations chapter 7, <clears throat> verses 9 through 12. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshipped God. They sang, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. So, Father... We thank you for your redemption, even in the smallest way that where we once picked up palms and waved them saying, Hosanna, save us now, that in the end we will pick up palms and say, you have saved us. God, you are the great restorer. You are the great redeemer. All things are reconciled because of your name. So Father, we worship you. And together, as people reconciled to God and reconciled to one another, we sing all power and glory and honor and strength belongs to you. We thank you. We love you. Let this be our worship to you today. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as one body together, we say, Amen. Amen. Would you continue to worship with us this morning? But by your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is 
Lord, we just expect you today. Yeah. You're here in this place. Come, 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 come. Open our eyes to you. Come, 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 yeah. We want more of you, Jesus, today. You're here in this place. We expect you today. Yeah, you're here. The king is in the room. Come see the scars of love upon his hands. The king is in the room. And we'll watch the darkness flee at his command. Oh, who is this king? <laughs> who is this king? Oh, his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Light of the world. There's freedom in his name. Awesome in power. Reigning forever. Light of the world. 
there's freedom in his name he's here oh the healers in the room yeah, come. let miracles break out across this place oh, the saviors in the room no soul beyond the boundaries of His grace Oh, there's resurrection power in His name And His name is Jesus His name is Jesus The light of the world And there's freedom in His name Oh, He's awesome in power Reigning forever Light of the world, oh, there's freedom in His His name is, oh, and His name is Jesus. Yeah, His name is Jesus. Light of the world, there's freedom in His name, and awesome in power, reigning forever. Light of the world, oh, there's freedom. There's freedom in His name, oh, always. Yeah, there's freedom in His name, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, there's never been a love so great. He died so we could live. Then He rose up from that. Oh, name another king like this. Now all authority forever belongs to him. He reigns in victory. Oh, name another king. God, there's never been a love so great. He died so we could live. Then he rose up from that grave. Oh, name another king like this. Now all authority forever belongs to him. He reigns in victory. And name another king. Oh, name another king like this. Yeah. Yeah, name another king like this. Oh, name another king like this. Oh, His name is Jesus, and His name is Jesus, light of the world. There's freedom in His name, and awesome in power, oh, reigning forever. He's the light of the world. Oh, there's freedom in His name is Jesus, His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus, light of the world. There's freedom in His name, and awesome in power, reigning forever. Light of the world, yeah, there's freedom. Oh, there's never been a love so great. Yeah, there's never been a love so great. He died so we could live. Then he rose up from that grave. Oh, name another king like this. Now all authority forever belongs to him. He reigns in victory. Name another king. Oh, name another king like this. Name another king like Jesus. Like Jesus. No one, no one, no one, no one. Hey. I can't name another king like this. Cause there's no one, no one, no one. His name is Jesus. And his name is Jesus. The light of the world. There's freedom in his name. Yeah, there is. An awesome in power, 
reigning forever, light of the world, there's free, yeah, sing that one more time, His name, and His name is Jesus, His name is Jesus, He's the light of the world, and there's freedom in His name, you're awesome in power, reigning forever, light of the world, Lord, there's freedom in His name, yeah, there's freedom in His name, there's freedom in Your name, there's always, always freedom in Your name, so we sing it out. We say, Jesus, Jesus, oh, there's freedom in your name, Jesus, it's only you, Lord, the one we're singing to, the one we're here today for, no one else, it's only you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, yes, yeah, sing it out, Jesus, Jesus, cause there's healing, Jesus, Jesus, he's Jesus, 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 cause his name is Jesus. Oh, His name is Jesus, the light of the world. There's freedom in His name, and awesome in power, reigning forever. Light of the world, there's freedom in His name. Yeah. This morning we just press into that truth. There's never been a love so great that died so that we could live, right? There's never been a love so great that would die so that we could live. And this morning, Lord, we declare and we decree and we align ourselves with the truth that there is no other name or person or king like Jesus. There's no other name by which whom we must be saved than Jesus. Amen? Before we move on, would you put out your hands just to receive from the Father this morning? God, we just thank you for the cross. We thank you for the power of your redemptive work in our lives. God, we give you praise. Can we just say, Lord, we give you praise together. Come on. Lord, we give you praise. Come on. Lord, we give you praise. A sacrifice of praise. It means it costs us something. God, we thank you for who you are, Lord. We thank you for your redemptive work. And Lord, we cannot help but sing your name, sing your truth this morning, God. And we just thank you, Lord. May Christ be magnified in us. May Christ be magnified. Amen. 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 Worthy all earth, echoing his eminence. His name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We hear Christ be magnified. Can we do that from the top? Put up those lyrics for you. Were creation suddenly articulate? With a thousand tongues to lift one cry From north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified Yeah, Christ be magnified in me Yeah, worthy. 
such a powerful statement that I won't bow, bow down to idols and in the context that we live we don't, some cultures have actual physical like monuments of idols, right? We've seen that but that's not just what this is talking about if that were the case I think it would be really obvious that like oh I'm not going to bow down to that wooden statue right? It would be like I'm not going to do that, it sounds silly, right? I know who God is but there are places in all of our lives that have a greater voice other than the voice of Jesus. And this is that bridge that we just sang right now is a pathway to what Jesus calls his life. It's a pathway to redemption, power of forgiveness, power of all that Jesus has for us. Amen. I just say that we won't bow down to freedom, to fear. To fear. To fear. Amen. We can't bow down to fear. Amen. 
Cause there's freedom in his name We won't bow down to fear Cause there's freedom in God's name We were made to worship him We were made to be free We won't bow down to fear No, no We won't bow down to fear No, no We won't worry, we won't worry, we won't worry, we won't worry, because there's freedom in his name. And Lord, along with that line, Lord, we will not bow down to fear. We will not bow down to fear. And so, Jesus, we just ask that perfect love this morning would cast out that fear. In redemption power of who you are, Lord. And Lord, I just thank you that 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 line that says death is just a doorway into resurrection life. Lord, we pray this morning that you would reveal your truth that death is just a doorway into all that you have. So Lord, we just continue to welcome you in this time.
You know, as we were in worship, I just feel like the Lord's hand is here to start breaking the chains of fear in our life. Um, so if you would just with me, I just want you to just bow your head in prayer and center in with the Lord on what he is bringing to mind right now in you. You know, fear is, fear is a funny thing because we need it. It's a normal human response to keep us safe, but we use it in places that it does not belong. And it has no place in the kingdom of God. It has no place. See, so much of fear is just our hearts seeing a pattern of places that we've been hurt, seeing a pattern of rejection, a pattern of being shut down and pushed away and ignored and neglected. Fear is our response to things that we have seen happen already, but God is doing a new thing. And when it comes to restoration, everything on the other side is perfect and it is good and it's him. So it's beautiful. And the way we get rid of that old pattern is with the new thing. It's with a thousand hallelujahs drowning out the voice of fear. It's over and over teaching ourselves a new way in step with the spirit to say, no, I'm choosing his truth. I am choosing to lay down what I have known. I am choosing to lay down my understanding and I'm choosing to hold to his truth. And he says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He says that nothing can separate me from his love. He says that I am his. He says that he has written my name in the palm of his hand. And when I move forward, I bring his love, which never rejects, which never disappoints, which never lets go. So God... Would this be the new pattern that we hold on to? Would you be faithful to whisper in our ears in those places of fear, whether it's new jobs or old family relationships where we know that we've been hurt time and time again? God, would you be the faithful voice that says, here, even here, I am doing a new thing. There has been hard ground. There has been death, but I am resurrecting and bringing new life here because he is God with us. He is Emmanuel. Isn't that just so beautiful that when he came, the name he gave himself was, I am with you. So Father, we look at the voice of fear and we tell it instead that we're choosing your way. Father, we choose you. With a thousand hallelujahs, we choose you. We're no longer saying, save us now. We're saying, you have done it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So with every heart and every voice in this room, before we say amen, can we lift up one more hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, you have saved us. Amen. Friends, we're so grateful to have this space set apart for worship. And there's so many ways that we come together and we listen to God's heart and we respond. If you're uh, practiced in the discipline of tithe as part of your worship and you've come prepared to give, we have three ways that you can do that here. Uh, You can give online, you can text to give, and you can do a check or cash in the boxes outside um, the lobby. There's a label. I'm not exactly sure where I'm pointing, but there is a label. (laughs) that you can do that there. Um, One of the ways that we love to partner with you and connect with you here is that if your heart language is not English, we want you to be able to listen to God's message for you, God's word in your heart language. So we have this service called Captional. Um, You can scan this QR code and you can get live captions 
of today's message, of the worship sets, of me talking like this right now, whatever you want to call this time and space, um, we'd love for you to download that and be able to engage in worship with your heart language here. All right, so to all of my first to sixth graders, if you're still in the building, we want to invite you to head over to our kids group leader. We have a time and space set apart for you so that you can lean into what God's doing in a way that meets your needs. So we want to bless you to head on over now. Uh, We love you. We cherish you. We champion you. And our kidsmen volunteers, you're number one. We love you all so much. (laughs) All right. Also, uh, we do want to invite everyone back uh, after our second service. Uh, Today is our family meal and noodles around the world. And so we're excited to uh, join together. It's also uh, the beginning, uh, actually uh, this week, uh, let me see if I can get this. Everyone has kind of made fun of me. It's Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Now, everyone can say that five times real fast, uh, but what's excited about that is we, as a church, get to celebrate uh, our diversity and different cultures, and uh, I'll tell a little bit about it in my message today, but uh, we're going to have events throughout this next month really highlighting and celebrating uh, the culture of those uh, in our family that are from Asian backgrounds, so excited for that. Exactly. So, again, we hope to see you at our family meal. Um, and for all the fun things coming up in May. Yes. Um, and with that. Sounds great. Let's and, bless uh, Pastor Doug. Into <laughs> yes. <laughs> and also, uh, believe it or not, Mother's Day is coming up. And so we want to uh, invite uh, you to uh, be a part of our Mother's Day uh, celebration. Today we are going to continue our uh, series in heaven, um, All Things Restored. And, you know, heaven is not just uh, uh, this place that kind of exists outside of our realm of really understanding. It really is a place of hope. It is a place of reward for those who, especially when we go through times of trials and hardship and when life gets really hard, it's heaven that keeps us going. All throughout history of mankind, there's been a a longing for more of heaven. Heaven, as we've already sung about and as we shared here, it's that place when all things are going to be made right, when all things that are broken are going to be restored, when all things are going to be made new. It's interesting. uh, That longing has always been there. I go back into Acts chapter 3. Now, this is right after uh, Jesus gave all of his promises, where he died on the cross, where he was resurrected, where the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came, the church of God was birthed. They're gathered in Jerusalem, they're in the temple. All of this is going on, and still at that point, there is an incredible amount of turmoil in society. There's problems that are happening within the church. All of these hard things are happening, and it was even there that there was a longing for Jesus' return, even days or weeks or less than a month since he ascended into heaven. Peter, when he's gathering in the temple, he gives this, he says this in Acts chapter 3, verse 21. For he, Jesus, he must remain in heaven until the time comes for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. That there was this longing, this hope, this mindset that says we're going to keep our eyes on that thing that Jesus promised, the total restoration of all things. Today we're going to specifically look at how God's heart is to restore our relationships with other people. Man, when we look at our society, right, there's so many things that are broken, especially when it comes to relationships, personally, but also as a society. I think one of the things that we hope for for the most when it comes to heaven is that grand reunion. That reunion that we hold on to with those that we have loved, that we want to do life with again, that have passed into eternity. And there's a longing for us to be reunited with those that love us. That's why Jesus said very clearly in John chapter 14 that if you are my follower, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He is setting apart a space for you in heaven. He said this, don't let your hearts be troubled. When you look at the brokenness and the hard things of this world, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Give your life to me. 
I want to be in relationship with you. And when you give your life to me, things shift and change. He says this, there is more than enough room for you in my father's house. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. Then when everything is ready, I'm going to come and I'm going to get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. And Job preached uh, or shared the, the rest of that passage in the opening where it says, I am the resurrection and the life. Every, no one comes to the Father. You can't come into this place unless you are with me. This is incredible news, not just for ourselves, but it is that hope we hold on to, that we're going to be reunited with those that have gone before us. Can you imagine what that's going to be like in the grandness of heaven where we are reunited and there we walk through the place and we see those that we have loved and we're with them, but we also see those that we've had good relationships with and, and we catch up and we have all eternity to do that. What an incredible hope that we can hold on to. But have you ever thought about the other people that are going to be in heaven? Those people that you kind of go to the grocery store, and have you ever done that? Where you see someone and you're like, oh, there's a rift between us, or there's an awkwardness that's there, and you see him going down the one aisle, and you're like, ah, I'm not going to go down that. So you pick another aisle, and then you play that shell game, and you look down to make sure that you can avoid them. Now, what's going to happen when they and you get to heaven? Yes, heaven is going to be big, but it's going to last forever. <laughs> and you're going to run into people. You see, it's our human nature, right? It's our human nature to divide. And those divisions and those barriers between us, that's part of the brokenness that we live in. Those divisions, those differences end up dividing us. And today, I think we all can agree that we live in such a polarized culture. Us versus them. Even within the church. You see, heaven is that place where all things are going to be restored. Those places of division, those lines of hostility, they're going to be destroyed and they're not going to exist anymore. We land at Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12, where it gives us a picture of what heaven is going to be like. Where John says this in his vision, After this, I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every get this every nation every tribe every people and every language standing in front of the throne and before the lamb they were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands and they were shouting with a great roar salvation comes from our god who sits on the throne and from the land and then angels came all around and singing in this heavenly thing you see, that's the picture of what heaven's going to be like. We're all going to be unified in our worship under Jesus. Here's what's interesting about this passage, though. This passage where it talks about all of the nations, all of the tribes, all of the tongues, all of the different ethnicities, all of the different people groups in heaven. And here's what's remarkable about that passage is that John is seeing this in heaven and he can see this vision and he can see and understand the throne room of God all giving glory to Jesus under his lordship. But yet he was able to recognize that there were people from every nation every tribe, every people group, every tongue. You see, when we get to heaven and we're worshiping Jesus, we don't lose our distinctness. We don't lose our cultural backgrounds. We don't lose who we are, how God created us, our backgrounds. All of that, all of our differences come in under the Lordship of Christ. That's why we, as a church body, as a family here on earth, we celebrate those cultural differences that we have with each other, and we celebrate them. That's why today, noodles around the world. What a gift that we have to celebrate those cultures that celebrate and rally and have food around noodles. Not every culture has it. 
right? We've been trying to figure out, okay, what is uh, Salvadorian noodles? There is none. So we'll have some time where we'll have rice and beans and we'll celebrate the different cultural backgrounds that we come from. (laughs) This month is Asian American Pacific Islander Month. And one of our activities that we're going to do on April, on May 21st, from 7, uh, 5 o'clock to 7, here at the church, we're going to have a cultural experience night where we um, um, artist Era Choi, who has been worshiping with us, she's going to come and give a workshop on Asian art. And here's the beauty of it, is we get to participate in that. We'll have uh, uh, Asian fans and do some uh, watercolors, and she'll teach us how to do that and the beauty of the culture around that. Be able to sample teas and different desserts and, 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 and appetizers from all different places around Asia. Why do we do that? Because God created us uniquely. And so when we worship God here on earth, just like it's going to be in heaven, we do so in every language, every nationality, every tongue, every people group. That's what heaven is going to be like. That's how we were created. However, as we've looked throughout this series, the goodness of heaven, God's intent, the way that he created it, Everything gets marred and messed up on this side of eternity. It's because of the sin and the corruption that we experience in this world. <laughs> Look at Adam and Eve, right? As soon as they took a bite of the, of the, of the fruit of good, uh, knowledge of good and evil, the sin and corruption came in. And what was their instant response? Look what she made me do. There was a blame that went on with each other. One generation removed from Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, competition, division. Your sacrifice and offering to the Lord is better than mine. Jealousy, hatred towards brothers. That ended up in what? The first murder recorded in Scripture. That same corruption where differences turn into divisions and hostilities continues from people to people, from families to families to people groups against people groups. Division separates us. Places of power emerge. Suspicion against each other, against different races or genders or class of people. That brokenness leads to hatred, oppression, places of injustice but here's the tragedy of where that curse of sin has penetrated it hasn't just come in our society it's also come to our churches how many times do we see within christians drawing those lines of hostility between different churches different denominations different races between different nations different political parties economics, classes. In fact, one commentator said this that kind of hit me pretty strong. If you feel that you have more common ground with an unbeliever who shares your same race or your same ideas or your same political parties than with a genuine Christian from another race, different ideas, a different political party, you have drawn a line that Jesus died on the cross to erase. You see, that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to, re- to reverse that curse, to restore all things, to break down those walls of hostility that divide us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, says this, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He <clears throat> united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separates us. I don't know if you've seen uh, on, on Facebook or Instagram uh, this, uh, this meme or, or this, uh, this picture, this saying that, that if, if Paul was around today, that he would write a letter to the American church. And I believe that. But he doesn't have to because he already wrote a letter that applies to us where he's calling us and saying we need to embrace and live out the good news of the gospel that Jesus came because Jesus came to restore those relationships 
with one another where the sin and the curse has been broken and divides us. In one of the letters that he wrote again in Galatians, Paul says this in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And you've been unified with Christ in baptism, in that public confession, in that declaration, Jesus, you are Lord, where he comes and he washes us and cleanses us and changes us into his image. We have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. The old clothes don't fit us anymore. And what are the old clothes? He says that there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now you belong to Christ. You are true children of Abraham. You're his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham is the same promise that he has to you. You belong and are part of his family. You see, many people believe that Paul was writing here to the church in Galatians because in the synagogues there was a prayer that many would say and they would pray in the synagogues every morning as they did their morning prayers. And the prayer would be, thank God that I was not born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. That there was this dividing line, these categories. And what Paul is saying here is that those walls, those barriers, those divisions are done away with. That you are no longer Jew or Greek. You're not in the inside group or the outside group. You're one now in Christ. You're not slave or you're not free. Your value isn't on what you produce. Your value isn't on how much you uh, profit society. How much power that you have. If you have it all or if you have nothing. The cross of Jesus breaks that barrier down. That there's no longer men or women where there's a place of dominance, of power. This unity, this picture of what heaven looks like on earth, it's not done by human achievement. Like how many times now do we look and we say, we could do this, we could break those barriers down, we could do that, and maybe some of those are good ideas, but what Paul is getting here is that it is only, div- uh, those divisions are only broken down through the person of Jesus. You see, it's only in Jesus that we are unified as one. It's only in Jesus that our div- differences are celebrated but they never divide us. You see, it's in Jesus that there is no second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. We're all brothers and sisters in Him. You see, it's in Jesus that everyone is honored and respected and loved because we're made in the image of God and we're brothers and sisters. And Jesus brought all of those places of divisions and He brought them in under the cross where there is an incredible amount of love. You see, it's this passage. It's Paul's exhortation to the church and to us today (laughs) that all ethnicities, that all gender, that all socioeconomic statuses, we're all one in Christ. That's what heaven is going to be like. When we stand and we worship, in our nation, in our tongue, in our tribes, with our people, with our differences, but we're all in under the unity of who Jesus Christ is. That is our citizenship. That is our destiny. That's what we get as being a part of the family of God. However, when we look at the world we live in, that's not what the reality is of the zip code that we live in. We live in a world that is polarized. That there are divisions. Where those differences aren't always celebrated, but those differences are pushed away, and those walls and those barriers come up. This whole series that we're doing on heaven, 
is to give us a glimpse of what heaven is, to understand the reality that we live in. And now how do we live out God's heart to restore to what he wants and what he originally did before sin came in and messed everything up? And so how do we live out God's heart to restore our relationships with other people? I want to give us a quick grid that we could step into to bring that restorative work, not just into our lives and into our family, but into society as well. How do we live in a world where there's brokenness and division, where that curse oftentimes overwhelms us. Here's the grid, and I'll unpack each one of these. We listen. We lament. We learn. And we love. We start by listening. James tells us in James chapter 1, verse 19, Understand this, my brothers and sisters, that you must all be quick to listen Quick to listen. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. And even slower to become angry. You see, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. And so get rid of all the filth and the evil in your lives and humbly accept what? The word God has planted in your hearts. For it has the power to save your souls. Friends, what is the impetus of this? Be quick to listen. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. We live in a society right now where anger is rewarded, where anger is put up and said, I need to become outraged by all of this ugliness that's in this world. And what James is pulling us back to today is that anger is, that anger is not going to produce the righteousness that God desires. So get rid of that filth, that evil in your lives, and humbly, putting ourselves lower, accept what God says, His Word, that's planted in your heart, that has the power to save our souls. You see, so many times when something comes up that's different, where that polarization takes place, we don't listen. We jump right to defend, to protect, to do the same things that Cain and Abel did. Suspicion. Protect what we have. Be jealous of what we don't. Feel threatened. And so differences, instead of listening and stepping into it, we divide and we step into that. We listen not only just to understand, but to connect with our heart. How many times when something comes up that seems divisive, we don't listen because we jump right to defense or argument instead of really listening to what God has been saying. And so we listen with both of our ears. One, to what is being said, but we're also listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying. What's He saying in this? Because when we truly step back to listen, and we listen not just from our minds, but we also listen from our hearts, now all of a sudden our heart starts to connect with the heart of those that are different and to the heart of the Father. We start to hear and to see and understand the pain of the curse of division instead of jumping right to solutions. You see, I think so many times when we hear something, it's disconnected from our heart and from pain. Because when those differences turn into division, it's when those places go up in our heart and in our mind. And the reason that I think so much polarization takes place is because we jump over the first two steps of listening and lamenting and we got right to learn and right to what our solutions are instead of taking that step back and really listening listening at a heart level and when we start to look and understand and listen our hearts become humbled and we start to see things in a different way 
And we see the pain. In grief. Even in those places where there's differences. And we are invited into a process of lamenting. Lament is simply this. It's a prayer expressing our sorrow, pain, or confusion. Lament is the way that we process grief in God's presence. I think for the church so many times, because we have focused on joy and peace and goodness, which is all great, we jump over lament. We pass right through that and pretend that everything is good. Oh, it's going to be good. It's going to be fine. Or we jump right into our arguments. But we live in a broken world. We are broken. We see and experience brokenness all around us. Places of sadness and sickness and agony. We hear of wars and rumors of wars in foreign lands. Stories of poverty, of neglect, of violence. That's what the 24-hour news cycle is all about. It's about brokenness and pain. And then it hits close to our home too. Where there's death and dying. Brothers and sisters suffering. Our neighbors losing. Friends turning away from the faith. Words that have been spoken to us or about us that cause deep wounds. Expectations that we have that have never panned themselves out. You see, when relationships are broken, either in the big macro story or even in our own personal stories, what do we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, do with all of this sorrow, all of this brokenness? It's in those places that we take it to the Lord. When we read through the Psalms, a third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. Where the heart of the writer of Psalms is crying out to the Lord because things are broken and not the way that they should be in their lives and the world that they live in. See, friends, God wants to hear our pain. He wants us to lament. Because when we lament, God shapes us. It's in those suffering, those times of sorrow, where we recognize God's wisdom and our finiteness. You see, sorrow and loss is always disorienting. No one emerges from grief saying, I got it all together. I'm wise. I got it all figured out. You see, when we're in those places of pain, we look to God and He reminds us that we don't have it all, that we are limited. But in our limits, we see how God is all powerful, all knowledgeable, all good. You see, it's in this lament that we learn to trust God. It's our direct expression of who God is in our, so- in our sorrow where we learn to trust Him for everything. And in that we understand and recognize how good God is, how gracious He is, how much He meets us in these places of loss and sorrow where division has pulled people apart, where we still see the curse of death, of division, of hatred, marring our relationships. You see, when we lament and we feel those deep places of pain, we become better neighbors. Because even in those places of difference, in those places where division has pulled us apart, we step in and we feel the pain. We feel the sorrow. And it makes us listen even better. But most of all, what lament does 
is that we walk as Jesus walked. Isaiah prophesied and says that Jesus is a man of sorrow. And we see the times in Jesus' life where he was high, where he was teaching, where he had authority, but we also see in places in Matthew 23 and Luke 19, in Mark 14, Matthew 27, Hebrews 5, where Jesus enters into a deep lament, a deep sorrow. Where he goes to the Father and he cries and he gives him the cry of his heart. You see, when we lament, we turn to God and we keep turning to him in both our places of joy and also in our places of sorrow. Here's how we lament and how lament is different than grieving and mourning and all the way that the world does. Because in our lament, Jesus is the center of it. He's the one that grounds us in those places. So friends, how do we bring restoration to a world that is broken? We listen. We listen beyond even our own understanding to connect ourselves with the heart of what's happening. We don't jump to anger We don't jump to accusation. We listen. We listen to their heart and we listen to what the Spirit is saying. And as our heart is connected, we lament. We feel the pain. And then we learn. We learn about ourselves. In this time, what is God saying about me in this situation? What do I need to learn about me? Matthew said this when there's a problem. Or Jesus said this in Matthew, when there's a problem between us, what do we do? Before we get the speck out of someone's eye, we learn about ourselves and get the log out of our own eye. We learn about the culture. We learn about the situations that cause the brokenness, that cause the pain, that cause the division. Even if it's places of evilness causing that, we still learn and understand. And above all, we listen to what the voice of God is saying to us. What is the Spirit saying to us? And how is that aligned with what the Word of God says Because I keep coming back to this over and over and over again. That in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul says to Timothy, go back to the Word of God because it is living and active. It is it all God's Word is God breathed, it's living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to those deep places of our heart and our soul, in our society, and in our culture. Paul doesn't have to write another letter to our church today because he already did and those words are alive and true for us today because he breathed it and it's alive. And so we listen, we lament, we learn. We learn about ourselves, we learn about the world, but we learn about what God says about it. My friends, that's why we have to be men and women of the Word of God who knows what it says. And as James told us when we listen, we humbly accept it. We don't use the Word of God as a weapon to build our own ideas and our own division. We use it to understand and how we live out God's heart to restore all things, including our relationship with other people. And then after we listen and we lament and our hearts are connected and we learn what God has to say, we love. And when I say we love, this isn't the romantic love where we go on vacation and we hug each other. This is an active love. It's a love that changes things. I love what Martin Luther King said, love, and this kind of love is, is, <clears throat> love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. We love like Jesus loved. How many times, even in the book of Mark, where we're going through the, the series, Good News, do we see this phrase, that Jesus comes up and he sees things that aren't right. He sees a blind man. He sees a leper. He sees a woman who's been bleeding. He sees people that are oppressed and pushed out. He sees a paralyzed man. 
And he sees the faith of his friends. And how many times do you see these words kind of hidden? And it's really easy to fly over them because we're so excited about the miracle and what Jesus did and the hope that's there that we miss this phrase and look at it and find it in Scripture when you read through the Gospels. It says that Jesus was moved by compassion. That word does not translate well. I have compassion. The compassion that Jesus felt, the word there that was used in Hebrew, that was again used in Greek, is this compulsion. It's emotion. It's deep, deep, deep feeling. The way that a mother feels for her child. An overwhelming emotion that compels you to act. This is how we bring heaven to earth. This is how we live out God's heart. To restore relationships with one another. We love the way Jesus loved. We live out Micah chapter 6 verse 8. O oh, people, the Lord has told you, this is what is good. This is what I require. This is what I'm asking of you. I'm asking you to do what is right. To do justice. I'm asking you to love. Love mercy. A love that deeply feels, that moves to action. And to humbly walk with your God. You see, here's the gift of heaven on earth. Is that he's created and given us a family. A family that he calls the church. A family that's made up of people from every nation. From every tribe, from every tongue. From every people group. He's given us a family that comes in under the lordship of Jesus where there is no Jew or Gentile. In this body, in this new family, there's no longer those who are out and those who are in. We're all in. There is no slave or master in this family that he's given us the church it's not based on how much power you have how much influence you have what you don't have you see the cross has made us all equal there's no male or female Meaning that there's not those who have power and those who don't have power. Those that have a voice and those that don't have a voice. You see, in this church, in this family, where we live out God's heart to restore a relationship with others, we're all sons and daughters of the King. On Mother's Day and Father's Day, the two messages we're going to hear is how does God call us and ask us to be spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers to raise up another generation of those who are part of this beautiful family here on earth. See, perhaps the most powerful place in Scripture is in John chapter 17 because this was Jesus' lament. The greatest lament on planet Earth. Where Jesus is feeling the pain of taking on the sin of the world. All of the division, all of the hostility. 
And he goes to this place and he prays. And what's his prayer? His prayer is for unity. His prayer is for oneness. Because he says in a world that's going to be so polarized, in a world that's going to be so different, where differences are going to be used as a place of division, the world needs to see what heaven is like. Where every nation, every tribe, every language, every political party is going to stand at the throne of God and worship. This is what heaven looks like on earth. God's heart is to restore our relationships with one another where our differences are celebrated and our differences do not divide us. Jesus, I pray that you will come and that you will walk us through any time we see differences that we listen, we lament, We learn and we love. Jesus, give us the hope and the picture of what heaven's going to be like. That grand reunion. And show us how to bring heaven here on earth, restoring relationships with one another. I love that four-step process of listen, lament, learn, and love. Um, And I just, I feel like there's so much opportunity for us here in this place to really lean into those steps and really listen for what God's heart is in your life, in your neighborhoods, in your communities, in your friendships. Where is God calling you to bring this light and this love? As uh, Pastor Doug was preaching, the words, the gospel of the kingdom came to mind. And I'd love to read for us this morning. It's uh, Matthew 4. It's when Jesus ministers to great crowds. And it says, And he went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the peoples. Friends, what we're stepping into, what the, you know, what Pastor Doug was talking about is that partnership with the gospel of the kingdom being spread and being touching lives. And it manifests in physical healing and physical breakthrough, but it also happens in the inner life and how we love and how we impact the lives of others. So I'm excited for what the Lord can do through us as we allow these truths to actually have its way in our lives. So in the same manner that Jesus moved with compassion, that he had emotion that compelled him to take action, he invites us to live that out today. So as we close our service, I want to invite you to stand and just receive a blessing as we send you out. Um, Because we are a people who are sent to bless. We are not sending you out as Stonecrest, but we're sending you out as God's children invited to join him on this mission of restoration. That when you go, this is the light and the love that you carry. It's a light that exposes not for shame, but for healing. It's a love that redeems and restores. It leads with mercy and compassion. That all that you need will be given and supplied to you because you're walking in step with the Lord who is here to bring all things into what is new. So we bless you to go to be his to carry his light and his love and that all that he has done for you when you give it away it gets multiplied you don't miss out it's just more I just bless you uh, with the word that you were enough Mm -hmm. you're enough to fulfill all that we are that was talked about you are enough 
to spread the gospel of the kingdom. And I bless you to do so in the name of Jesus. So my friends, as you go out, we are so excited to see you when we see you again. We hope to, that some of you come back and join us for our family dinner yes. tonight. Come back. Come uh, back. Noodles around the world tonight, this afternoon. <laughs> you know, noodles around the world. Bring a dish to share or just bring yourself and some loved ones and have some good conversation around the table. Let's let this place be the first part where you start to see restoration in your relationships. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll, we'll see, see you, you next- soon. <laughs>